Welcome, Janet. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. My pleasure. Fun to be here. So Tantalizing 27, your latest book in the Stephanie Plum series, Fortune and Glory. Congratulations on this one. Are you still getting excited when this is the 27th book in a series? Do you still get excited for Pub Day and all of that? Um, yeah, I do. I, you know, I usually get a little bit more excited when I can actually do book tour and, and go out and see everybody. Um, so this is a new experience for me, you know, all this virtual stuff. But, but it's fun to have it out there, you know, because that's why you write the book so that other people can read it. And, um, I, you know, especially for me, because I think of myself as being the fun author, you know, <laughs> I, don't, um, this is, I don't kill any good people in this book, only bad people. So, uh, yeah, so I look forward to it. I mean, you might argue that killing people at all does not make you a fun author. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> there are some books where, no, there are some books where nobody dies at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I read a lot about your background and how you got started and how your manuscripts were rejected and your romance novel career. And I would just like to hear a little more from you about how you became sort of this powerhouse author of this hugely successful best-selling series in such a unexpected way if I were to tell you at age, I don't know, 20, that this is what would happen. So can you tell me a little more about getting started and sort of how you kept the resolve to keep going? Yeah, I was um, this amazing overnight success that took 20 years. <laughs> I, you know, I wasn't published until I was in my 40s. And so, which is amazing since, you know, I'm only 35 now. So right, exactly. You know, yeah. It, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was always the kid that could draw. I was not a big reader. I read comic books. I love comic books. Um, I still have a subscription to Uncle Scrooge. So, um, <laughs> you know, being a writer was not, um, was not something that I thought about as a kid or in high school or even in college. I was, I was always, you know, a visual artist. And then I had a couple kids and I was at home and painting just wasn't working for me. And what I realized is that what I always loved about painting was telling the story about the picture I was doing. And I loved reading stories to my kids. And all of a sudden, you know, it was like this thunderbolt moment, you know, that hit me. God, maybe I should be telling stories instead of painting pictures. And, but I had no background. I didn't know anyone who was a published author. I had very um, small, you know, literary background. Um, I think I had, you know, like English 101 in college. And so, you know, it took me a long time to learn my skills, to figure out where I wanted to go. I started out writing bizarre books because, you know, as a, a student in the Douglas College Art Department, um, there were, you know, I had teachers like Roy Lichtenstein and, um, you know, big guys um, that were really kind of out there. And so, you know, it took me a long time to figure out what I wanted to say, who I was, where, where my voice was. And um, the difference was that after about 10 years of sending out um, stories and not having any success at all, I realized that um, it, it wasn't enough for me to write for myself. Yeah, I love to write. I enjoy it. I get up in the morning and I go into my own world. You know, um, it's the world's best job. It's, it's, uh, you, you sit in this chair, you know, at 530 in the morning and, and I, and I go into, you know, someplace, uh, it's almost like being an actress and assuming another role. And so, uh, but what I realized is that if people weren't reading it, it, it didn't, it wasn't any fun for me. It wasn't enough that I was enjoying it. And when I realized that what I wanted to do was to write for other people and not for myself, I mean, that just made a huge difference. I started looking at audience and what books I was reading and I was a young mother, you know, and so I knew about love and relationships and happiness and, that was where I started with the little romance novels that I was reading. Um, and then after um, about five years, actually after about three years of that, uh, cause I was writing, I, I needed money. See, by then my, 
my kids were looking at college and my husband has a doctorate in mathematics. He, you know, he has a good job, but we were competing with two income families and I was a stay at home mom. So, uh, so I really needed to get smarter about it. So um, not only did I have an audience to read my books, but I could, you know, help out with the family income. And uh, that was when I, you know, turned to the romance novels. Um, halfway through that, my son um, was at Dartmouth <laughs> and the romance novels were not making enough money and I wasn't reaching enough audience. It, I was a, it was a very finite audience that I had with romance novels. So I decided to go into crime fiction. Um, I had little, little snippets of adventures and crimes creeping into my romances anyway. Um, I had a hard time with uh, 300 pages of relationship. It just, you know, I, it just, it wasn't my thing. There were many things I loved about romance and I tried to bring them over into the mystery genre. Um, and so, you know, I wrote romance for, I guess it was five years, uh, did 12 books and, um, and then took a year off and tried to retool and figure out where I wanted to go and decided that it was in crime fiction. And what I was going to do was I was going to take all the things I loved about romance and squash it into a mystery format. And that's what I did. And sold the first book to Scribner. Um, had a fantastic editor, really nice lady. She thought she was buying a mystery. Well, it wasn't much of a mystery. It really was um, kind of a sexy book with some romance in it and some, you know, um, characters that I found interesting that I knew. I said it, I knew I wanted to do a series. So I said it in New Jersey because that's what I know. And I gave my heroine, Stephanie Plum, a lot of my own history. So I knew where she was going. I put it in Trenton. I spent a lot of time in Trenton. My parents lived just outside of Trenton at the time. And, um, and I, that first book um, did not get me a lot of money, but you know, it got me a start. Um, I didn't sell a lot of books. Mostly I sold them to my relatives and my neighbors. <laughs> uh, but you know, by the second book, it started to pick up. And um, by the third book, I, I was learning a lot about myself and a lot about where I wanted to go and a lot about my audience. Um, and, you know, I mean, and the audience is the best part. I love my audience. I mean, when I have signings and I go out and I get to meet everybody, it's amazing. I mean, whole families will come out to say hello to me, you know, four generations and, and husbands and, and, and the husbands say things like, uh, I, I finally read one of your books and I really liked it. <laughs> you know, like they were shocked because, um, because their wives had been reading me and had been laughing in bed. And, uh, you know, and finally they took a look at it to see what it was too. So I don't, I don't know. I probably answered about 15 questions now because once I get started, uh, you know, especially about how this all happened to me, because I'm, you know, I'm the American dream. My, my uh, grandparents immigrated to this country as indentured servants, um, domestics and factory workers. And my dad um, and mom were the first to graduate from uh, high school. My dad worked in a factory. My mom was a homemaker. And I was the first to graduate from college. Um, I, we didn't have money for me to live in a dorm. I commuted. I was a commuting student at the state college in New Jersey and um, was an art student. Um, hate, hate to admit this on air, but sort of supported myself with some shoplifting of groceries and, oh, no. and art supplies when I had to, you know, and, and here I am. And, um, you know, it's amazing. It's, this is, this is a fantastic country. You know, I'm, I'm the proof of the opportunity that you can have. I've been very lucky. It's so nice to hear you say that because I feel like it's the American dream right now is like this elusive concept and I feel like it's so much less attainable than it used to be. I feel like it seems so impossible to achieve it. Um, so it's so nice to see an example, particularly from a woman who's saying like, look, I can do this and so can you. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, I think the American dream, I think that's a lot of... Um, 
I, th I think it's it's a lot of baloney out there that the American dream is not achievable. I think it's more achievable than ever before. It's that people are trying to tell us that it isn't, and um, and we don't we don't hear about all of the successes. We have a tendency to have people, you know, out there with a lot of the negatives. Um, it's not a bad thing because we need to. Um, you know, like broaden the scope of what's available to people. But I mean, you know, my gosh, we, we had, um, we, I, we have so many opportunities in this country and look at the standard of living that we have and the standard of living that, you know, that we can have, that we can, you know, um, bring out into even more people, the, the healthcare that we have. I mean, the fact that, in such a short amount of time, we found better ways to um, to treat COVID. We have uh, um, a vaccine right on the horizon. I mean, unheard of, you know, just amazing. And, and what I find really, really um, fantastic is that when COVID hit, I mean, it just did terrible things to the economy. And there are a lot of people out there, all those little small businesses that are just dying, you know, they're just struggling to survive. And at the same time, there are a lot of people that took the American spirit and said, you know, I can make some money out of this. I'm gonna start making masks. Um, I'm going to do takeout in my restaurant. I'm going to um, deliver curbside. I'm going to, so, there, there's a, still a lot of opportunity out there. Uh, maybe it's not as available to everyone, but but it's there. And and I think you know, I just I I'm a real believer in the American spirit, and I just think you know it's there, and um, people are going to find it. And you, you know, you have to persevere. I mean, I, I was. It took me um, oh gosh, at least ten years to get published. I started writing in my 30s, all this bizarre stuff, sending it out, nothing. Um, I mean, I had, I started collecting rejection slips and I started out um, in a little shoe box and then it got to be a bigger box. And um, after 10 years of rejections, I mean, I had rejections that were written on bar napkins and crayon. I, you know, it was, it was bad. And after 10 years of rejections, I gave up. I um, went out and sat on the curb in front of my house with this big box and cried my eyes out and burned every rejection. Uh, and I wish I hadn't done that because yeah. you know, I, would, I would have liked to have had them now. Um, and the next day I borrowed a suit from my sister and I went out and I got a job with manpower and I worked at manpower for, I don't remember, I think it was, um, maybe three, four months. And, um, I had given up. I mean, it was my dream and it was crushed because we needed the money. I just didn't feel like I could keep going anymore. And, um, so I was after work, I went to pick my daughter up at the at an ice skating rink she was ice skating and i was standing there waiting for her and my husband and my son came up and they put their arms around me and they said your editor just called and i mean this was what a hundred years ago and um and and i can't think about it without you know without getting very emotional because it was like um you know, there was my dream. My dream came back and, and my life just started over. You know, it was, and that was, um, you know, and I made $2,000 on that first book. The, the very next day, I went into the office uh, with a, a box of donuts and I left it at the office and I took my hairspray, my extra pair of shoes, <laughs> and, and I went home. I just, I, right there, I just quit. I just walked right out. And, um, and then I didn't sell another book for a couple of years. We sort of had to give up eating oranges to make ends meet. But, um, but eventually I started getting multiple book contracts and, you know, it just, and here I am. Wow. What a story. That's so amazing. That's just, I mean, it's so inspiring. My whole, when you were telling it, my, like I had goosebumps everywhere. That's amazing. Yeah, um, it's been good. Congratulations on like, sh and the role modeling of all of it is just great. 
just shows, right? Like if you just stay with it and you keep doing something that you love, it's eventually, it will pay off in some way, shape or form. I mean, yours was a particularly big payoff. I will grant you that, but still. <laughs> right. Um, tell me a, bit, a little more about starting with the romances and how, for instance, your son at Dartmouth felt knowing those scenes were out there. You, you, I read that you said somewhere that uh, you stopped writing romance when you, when you ran out of positions to put your characters in. <laughs> so tell me a little more about that and sort of being a mom and having all this sort of sexualized content out there. Well, you know, it wasn't that sexualized. I mean, um, as a romance writer, uh, you know, it was a very po a positive um, genre, which, and which is one of the things that I love about it. And it's one of the things that I think is such a great reflection of women, you know, because we're we're nurturers and we are, um, you know, po we try to be positive people, and it was a positive. Um, genre it, you know the romances ended happily they were about basically good people i didn't have to kill anybody in a romance you know and um so when i started doing this i think initially um my family was a little embarrassed uh they're like oh god you know mom is writing this book and my husband you know uh, you know is this a reflection on me well it turned out that it was actually a very good reflection um, my son was very popular in college. <laughs> his, his mother, we told everybody his mother was writing soft porn. You know, and, and <laughs> that was good. That was good for him. Um, uh, my husband found out that he'd be uh, in the elevator and women would come in and would want to talk to him, you know, and I noticed that his ties started getting a little flashier. And he uh, he really milked it, you know. When, when I when I eventually moved over into the uh, mystery genre and I started with Plum, you know, then then he could tell everybody he was actually Ranger, and uh, you know everything was patterned after him. I mean, my family really got into it, and you know. Um, they we all work together now we're a little family business so i saw that so you have even ivanovich inc right yeah and so what does everybody do how do you and how do you make sure to work together in a seamless way um uh well we all have different talents um but at the same time we all we're sort of like water you know when there's an opening we flow into it um, we, we really, we don't, there's not a lot of ego involved. We actually like each other. Um, we, we pretty much live together. We move around like a little herd. Uh, in the beginning, it was that, um, my daughter, uh, went to film and photography school, Brooks in California, and she had some aspirations of her own and then decided that maybe that wasn't who she was. But at the time, um, websites where you know the computer was just starting um, to really have an influence and she said you know um, you're sort of halfway supporting me while I'm doing my thing in San Francisco why don't I set up a website for you so she started my very first website and it became a full-time job for her because she turned it into this entertainment site really helped to grow my audience made it fun made it a lot more fun so that was initially what she did. My son is brilliant and he um, took over family finances. Um, he uh, had some legal experience. So he was the contract reader, as was my husband. Um, and everybody edited. They were all my first editors and they still are. Hmm. As, as um, we went along, they sort of modified their roles until now. Um, my husband is still editing. He's still reading contracts. He's keeps track of foreign sales and that kind of thing. Uh, but my son and my daughter um, are doing more creative things. They're still my editors, um, but they edited me for so many years that they picked up a lot of writing skills. And so my son has been working as a co-author with me. Uh, he, he actually, has been a co-author for longer than people realize because when um, books would come in and they weren't exactly in my voice and they um, just needed some extra help, Peter and Alex would jump in and they would do some writing for me because I had a pretty heavy schedule just doing original writing. 
So they, they really did a very heavy editing job for me for several years. And, uh, and now they're, you know, they're branching out, they're doing their own thing. Alex is in charge of everything um, that is on the computer, all my media. She interfaces with publishers and publicists and my agent. And she's, she's really the one that says, um, your fans aren't gonna like this, you know, she, because she always toured with me in the early years. She was the one who read the emails. She was the one who got in the lines and talked to people when I only had a couple minutes. You know, when I was doing the big book tours, I'd have two, 3,000 people out at a night. And, you know, we'd start signing at 5.30 and we'd end at two in the morning. Oh my and gosh. so um, I was, you know, moving people along pretty fast saying, hi, how are you? And, you know, would you like your name on this? And then, they, and then they'd have to move along. But Alex was there and Alex got to go down the line and she got to talk to everybody and made friends and, you know, you know, exchange Christmas cards and found out what they thought and what they liked and what they didn't like and what they wanted to see. And so she's just been huge in the development of my career, the Plum series, um, some little side series that we've done um, just to give me some variety for fun. And um, unfortunately, you know, I'd like to clone myself so I could do more of those side series. <laughs> so it turns out that the secret weapon in your whole crime series is your children. <laughs> it's pretty <Yes>. awesome. <laughs> Um, so what, uh, what, how many, first of all, how, how high are we going to go with the Stephanie Plum series? How do you have like a number? Are you stopping at 30 or is this an indefinite amount? And then also what, what's like the next project to come out after this one? Um, no, I don't have a number. I, as long as I'm enjoying it, I'm going to keep doing it. And, um, as long as, you know, people out there are buying the books, it's, um, I, I don't, I don't have, the, you know, the difficult thing is these two guys in Stephanie Plum's life because, um, it, you know, there's, there's this tendency, you just, you know, you, you want her to make a choice, you want her to, <laughs> oh, and, you know, have babies and live happily ever after, you know, just like I did. And, but, you know, but that, that doesn't work in that series. It's kind of takes the, fun, the fun of it is the adventure, the, you know, the not knowing the, the choices that she has and the life that she can have that, you know, the rest of us really can, we, we would be scandalous if we did. Um, so I don't have any set number for her. The next book that's coming out is um, one of the co-author books. It's The Bounty. It's in the Fox and O'Hare series and it has a new co-author. I've had a lot of co-authors. I, I go through, I'm, I'm like, you know, <laughs> death on co-authors. I think, I don't know. I don't know how James Patterson does it. He, God, he keeps these same great co-authors and it goes on to infinity. And my, my you know, my co-authors are uh, with me for a, a co they're all friends is, you know, part of the problem. You know, Lee Goldberg, I knew him for years. Same with Beep Sutton. And they come on board and we have some fun and we write a bunch of books. And then they say, eh, you know, I think I'm going to go, you know, be like a big shot in television again because they were all, um, you know, A-list sitcom writers. And uh, so I have, I have a new co-author on this book. Uh, the last co-author in the Plum series, in the uh, Fox and O'Hare series, my son jumped in and did, and he did that at the last minute. That book almost didn't come out. And Peter um, said, okay, I can do it and stopped his life for about two and a half months and helped us get the book out. This book is, um, is, uh, you know, in a, another new direction. And uh, so that comes out in March. And then after that, I have um, a spinoff from this book that's out there right now. It's about a woman, Gabriella um, Rose. And she's, um, I, I wanted to do, whenever I do um, these little mini series, I always like to do something that the heroine is very different from Stephanie Plum. Um, just to give myself a break and, you know, so I can have some fun too. And what I find is that when I go into some other woman's head other than Stephanie Plum, and then I go back to Plum, I always know a little bit more about her because of what I've learned about this other person. So um, that book should come out sometime in the summer. It's uh, about Gabriella Rose. Very exciting. 
So what advice would you have to aspiring authors? You know, if it's important to you, just don't give up. Keep trying to do better. Keep learning. Um, join a professional organization um, like International Thriller Writers, Romance Writers of America. Um, and that really helps because it allows you to get a peer group. It allows you to learn some things about agents and the process and publishers. Um, but, you know, basically it's, you know, you got to keep your ass in the chair. You really do. You, you have to, I, I like to tell people, you know, it's, it's like a job. It's like, you know, if you took a job working at 7-Eleven um, and they expected you to be there for three hours, you know, um, at seven o'clock at night, you'd, you'd, you'd do it. You'd get there. It wouldn't matter. You know, if you had a cold, you'd show up anyway. You'd take some pills. And writing is like that. If, if you want to do it, you, you think of yourself as a writer. When people say, what do you do? You say, I'm a writer. <laughs> you know, I'm not published, but I'm a writer. And every day, if it's only for a half an hour, you sit down and you write because that momentum is very important. It's important that you believe in yourself, even when you have 10 years of failure like I do. I mean, you know, look at me. I, I was... I was rejected for 10 years and I was not giving up. And so until you make my 10 year mark, you know, <laughs> don't worry about it. Just keep going. And be ready to forego oranges for as long as necessary, I guess. <laughs> yeah, do what you have to do. Do what you have to do. Um, well, thank you, Janet. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to chat with you and hear the backstory and, um, and, all of your encouraging remarks from the American dream to your first novel to everything. So thank you for sharing your time with, with me and with my audience. Oh, you're welcome. It was great being here. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.